Hello, this is our week seven bonus lecture. Last week's bonus lecture discussed running records and how to accurately record the student's reading behavior to give a running record in the instance that you wanted to use this excellent informal assessment to measure the student's ability to recognize words in context. This week we are taking a look at how to analyze the running record uh, specifically to do a miscue analysis. So our one objective is to accurately analyze a running record to determine A, noteworthy patterns, and B, the cueing system being used by the reader. So a quick, quick rewind of what running records are. Um, they are a reading recovery assessment developed by Mari Clay. They document a student's reading of continuous text. They are a tool to help teachers identify patterns in reading behavior. Why are patterns important? Because they allow the teacher to see the strategies a student uses to make meaning of words. And they can be used to determine the instructional reading level, although they should be paired with a comprehension measure and ultimately inform teaching. They can also be used to show growth over time if you are doing them at various frequent intervals. So that is running records. You can make them authentic. By using any text, you don't need to rely on a boxed set of assessments. You can use them with whatever you are studying or working on in the classroom. You can even administer them within the context of the school day. They can occur naturally during silent reading time or during reading centers. All you need is a blank sheet of paper or a blank running record form, a pencil and the text, and you are ready to go. Once we do the running record, <clears throat> we can do a quantitative analysis of the results by finding the error ratio, which is one in front of the words read divided by errors. So if the student read 119 words with six errors, you do one in front of 119 over six, which gives you one error for every 19.8 words read. You can also calculate the accuracy rate, which is just words correct over total words. So if they had 300 words and 279 were correct, we get 93% accurate, which puts them at the instructional level. And lastly, the self-correction ratio, which is one in front of the errors plus the self-corrections divided by the self-correction. So let's say they make six errors, three are self-corrected. We get one um, error for every three self-corrections. So that is the quantitative analysis that can be done from a running record. Some of the qualitative but quantitative analysis you can do is to look at the frequency of some of the reading behaviors. And what I mean by that is being on the lookout for any of the following. Excessive substitution. Substitutions are the number one type of miscue on a running record. So if they have an excessive amount of substitutions, it's highly likely that this text is not at their independent reading level. Also being on the lookout for meaning changing substitutions, which imply that the student is not considering the meaning of the text as they're reading. Looking for non-meaning changing substitutions, which means they are thinking about the meaning of the text and possibly the syntactic structure, but might not be using their um, decoding word recognition skills and um, visual cueing system. Uh, the second most common type of miscues is omissions, which happen for two reasons. One, they don't know the word and so they skip it, they omit it, or two, they are reading um, either quickly or not carefully and they just skip over it. So be on the lookout for that. And the third most common type of miscue is the insertion, which a lot of times happens because they're reading, reading, reading. They make a prediction about what the next word will be, but actually it's not that word. 
self-corrections and repetitions were once perceived to be errors and counted against the reader, but now these are considered signs that the reader is employing fix-up strategies, so they are no longer counted as an error. A lot of times they might repeat a word to make sure that it makes sense or they will self-correct um, when they realize that it does not make sense. So those are all positive things. They are utilizing their semantic cueing system and realizing, hey, that doesn't make sense or I don't understand that and I'm going to reread. And again, those are very positive things. So let's talk more about miscue analysis and the cueing systems. There are three cueing systems which students use to make sense of text. They can be used independently or in conjunction with one another. Um, look at the cueing system the student is using to help them. All right, so let's take a look at this sample text. What do you notice? All right, that was probably enough time. Let's see. Miscues are not um, errors. They are unexpected responses cued by a reader's linguistic or conceptual cognitive structure. So they're actually a positive thing. A better way to understand and interpret the types of problems and challenges children encounter reading. So there are actually three queuing systems that, again, we use independently or together. The first is orthographic, sometimes called graphophonic, which is where the reader uses individual letters or letter clusters to predict sounds. For example, in this sentence, I like to see horses at the farm. They might, like to, they might say, I like to see hares at the farm because um, they see that initial H and the ending S and they'll just kind of guess in the middle and it doesn't make sense semantically. So that's the orthographic cueing system or the graphophonic cueing system, also sometimes called the visual cueing system. The next cueing system is syntactic cues, which the reader use elements, uses elements of the sentence structure to make predictions while reading. So in that same sentence, I like to see horses at the farm. They might say, I like to fly horses at the farm um, because they know that a verb needs to follow to, and so they insert a verb using syntactic clues. The last cueing system is semantic cueing. Um, at the highest level, readers use meaning as their primary guide while reading. So when they use the semantic cueing system, they are thinking about the meaning of the text. So I like to see horses at the farm. They might say, I like to see ponies at the farm, which actually utilizes both the um, semantic cueing system and the syntactic cueing system because they are inserting a noun for a noun, in fact, a plural noun for a noun. So that's um, an example of how you see more than one cueing system working together. So moving on, here is student A, B, and C. Let's see if you can identify which cueing system the reader is using. Graphophonic, semantic, or syntactic? All right, let's take a look at student A. The wasps buzzed around my head as many as could be, but couldn't get there to string me. So overall, this person would be using the graphophonic cueing system. They are making substitutions that look visually similar to the target word, but do not make sense semantically. Let's take a look at student B. The wasps fell around my hand, as mad as cold could be, but wouldn't get in to steal me. 
this person would be using the syntactic cueing system, generally speaking, because they are um, substituting a similar part of speech for the target word. So buzzed, past tense verb, fell, past tense verb. Um, both of these are parts of the body, both verbs, both prepositions, you get the point. And student C, by process of elimination, would be using semantic cueing. The wasps flew around my head, mad as could be, but could not get in to hurt me. So that makes sense semantically, um, but as you can see, they're omitting some things, um, saying the contraction is two separate words, etc. All right, so let's go back to this initial segment of text and now see what you notice. You might notice that here the student is relying on the visual or graphophonic cueing system by saying she wanted have, but then is like, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. So semantically, using the semantic cueing system, they self-correct it to she would have to go to a new school. Same thing happens again here. She wasn't sure she wanted like, ooh, wait, that didn't sound right. She wasn't sure she would like, so they self-correct it again. Kate's father look her to her new classroom using graphophonic again, but actually didn't self-correct using semantic cueing. The teacher smiled at her and said, sit her by me. That makes sense semantically, but actually isn't the same part of speech syntactically. Kate looked at the story, so inserting a word so that semantically it makes sense. And then down here, Kate felt a little bumpter. Does not make sense um, semantically or syntactically, so again, graphophonic. So this student, it seems like primarily is using their graphophonic or visual cueing system, followed by the semantic cueing system and they're able to self-correct some of those ones that just don't make sense but not all of them. All right that concludes our bonus lecture. I hope you learned a little bit about the three cueing systems so that later in this course when you are giving any form of running record or recording students reading um, a section of text you feel comfortable looking at those miscues that the students are making and determining which queuing system they might be over relying on or not utilizing. All right, have a great week. Let me know if you need anything. Remember, I always have office hours Mondays 7 to 8.30.